What's going on guys? It's Coach Steven with 15 Points of Tennis and today we're going to talk about a very important aspect and that is in tennis is closing. A lot of times you can hit six, seven, eight, nine quality shots but just you can't put the nail in the coffin to finish the point, right? Or how about playing for a good 90 solid minutes but that last game or two becomes exponentially more daunting, more difficult, and I've had so many, me personally, I mean, who hasn't had so many matches just kind of slip through the cracks, and it's this very helpless feeling, and in my mind, it's a lot of hard work going to waste. Now, guys, it's not just tennis, but closing is a critical skill in life, and a lot of times, closers are more highly valued than just pure hard workers because closers know how to produce and get it done when it really counts. All right, so today we're gonna actually borrow a few concepts from a field where closing is life or death. And that's the field of sales. Because in sales, if you can't close, you don't eat, you don't have a job. Now, I'm no sales guru, but I've had a few sales jobs in the past. And I've studied the craft enough to realize that, you know, Closing, it, it isn't a mystery. It isn't some magical power. It doesn't happen by chance, right? There are universal mechanics to closing, and those same mechanics apply to closing in tennis. Now, maybe you might have been told closing is some kind of killer instinct, or it's having nerves of steel, or an aggressive mind that ABCs always be closing, right? And that's really good. At the same time, it's very vague. And when you think about it, how does it really apply to your game when it comes to tennis? Now, I bet you ran into, in your lifetime, salespeople who are pretty bad. They're you know, obnoxious, uncalibrated. But there are also a lot of tennis players who have a very wrong idea about closing, okay? So in this video, we're going to go through a bunch of different talk topics. It's going to be a little bit longer. We're going to go from the fundamental concepts to the intermediate and advanced concepts. And in the timestamps below in this video, we're gonna list those out. So feel free, because this is a longer video, to come back to it. The content is gonna be very, very dense, so I'm gonna need you to be very focused and very patient as you go through it. But at the same time, it's gonna be very potent, very powerful. I guarantee you, you're gonna walk out of this video understanding how to be a highly effective closer. All right, now to preface this video, guys, we're always going to do the sales example followed by the, the identical tennis scenario. All right, so when you're selling, you're taking the potential buyer through a series of steps, similar to in tennis when you're constructing a point. So it might look something like this. First, you generate a lead. you got to find the customer, right? Who's my customer? Then you have to ask qualifying questions and qualify them to figure out what is it the heck they want? What do they need? What are their desires? Then you have to pitch your product in a way where your features and benefits match the desires and needs of your customer. And finally, you have to answer their objections and concerns so your customer can make a logical decision and feel good about their buying decision. Guys, now those are just steps in the process. But ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to reach a threshold. And in sales, that threshold is when the customer realizes there's more pain than, sorry, there's more pleasure than pain for buying, or there's more pain than pleasure than not buying. The customer originally comes in with more pleasure than pain than not buying, you have to flip that, right? By increasing the pleasure and, and for buying and increasing the pain for not buying. Ultimately, boop, what's that skill tips? then you've closed the deal. Now tennis, it's not pain and pleasure. Tennis, you should be thinking about what's called pressure, right? Your opponent has a pressure threshold. And I talked about it in other videos, there are five ways to pressure your opponent. Consistency, direction, depth, spin, and power. But once you've pushed your opponent past that, their pressure more than they can handle, they're either gonna make an error or you're gonna hit a winner, one of those two options. Guys, now let's get to the meat of the video. When you're selling, you can do the first 90% of the sale perfect. Absolutely perfect. 
But what will kill your clothes is not being ready. And I know it sounds stupid, right? Not being ready for the clothes. But literally, if you don't have a pen and paper ready to sign when your customer is ready to buy, you're going to lose a sale. If you're fumbling around for your pen and paper, you're getting to the point where the scale, the pain pleasure scale is about to tip and then boom, go the other way and, and close the deal. But if there's uncertainty in the buyer's mind that you're incompetent for fumbling around during the close, it's gonna set you so far back, you won't be able to close, okay? Now, that's very similar in tennis. Let's say you've hit three, four, five pressure balls on your opponent. You're about to break that pressure threshold. And now your opponent's giving you a short ball, a, a, a floater, a sitter, right? You're about to put that ball away. Uh, again, it sounds stupid. If you're not ready for that ball, if you don't see it right off, off their strings and are ready to attack mentally, you won't be able to close. In fact, if you're like, oh, and then, and then you attack the short ball, it can be the juiciest short ball in the world. If you, if you force your attack and try to attack on a ball you're not ready for, you're not prepared for, you're going to make a lot of errors and overhit. If you, oh, if, if you are unprepared for that short ball, the best thing you, you can actually do is hit another rally, a setup ball, and get back and recover. So it's very, very similar, okay? And obviously, that's why a short ball is so easy in drills. It's because you know exactly when it's coming. The student is gonna hit a quality serve, and you're gonna see the split set come late, and he's not gonna be ready for the ball. And so even though the shot he should close on, since he's late and not ready, now he has to play a rally ball back. He has to take some pace off the ball to get it in. Now I'm back on balance and making him run, making him play defense. That's a lost opportunity to close. On this next point, he's not going to be moving a whole lot faster, but right after the serve, he's ready with his eyes. He's watching my body language, reading the play before it happens, so he can move in and hit this forehand on the rise, and although he misses a volley, it's a great setup point. Same with this next point, he's ready so fast that as soon as the ball comes off my strings, he knows exactly what shot he's going to hit. And I mean, similar to Roger, Roger's already taking his backswing and attacking as his opponent is playing defense. The moment they look up, he's putting the ball away. And when it comes to closing, you don't necessarily have to move forward kamikaze style, but on these next two points, He's going to be ready so fast, it allows him to track the ball right away. Now, because he's tracked the ball right away and lined his shot up, he doesn't have to watch the ball that closely because he's lined it up already. Now his focus and awareness is opened up. His mind space is opened up to watch me as, am I going to move to cover cross or stay home and cover line? He can hold a shot and go behind me like this first point here. And this next point, he's so ready, he's watching me, he's already, right off, the, right after my return, he sees me not recover, rips it to the open court. So that's why, guys, a close, a successful close, begins long before the close happens, it begins with the preparation. As a salesperson, I would ask you, do you have the contract within an arm's reach, so when the customer is ready to go, everything goes smooth. Otherwise, the customer is going to say, ugh. Oh, you know, if they're waiting and you're fumbling around, they're gonna say, let me think about it. Let's do it another time. We're not sure right now and you've lost the sale. And in tennis, similarly, I would ask you, do you know your top options to close? Let's just say, what are your three top closing shots, right? And it could be, it could be a high forehand that you hammer down. It could be an inside out forehand, a drop shot, an angle volley, a swing volley, all right? What are your best shots to close points out? And they're probably going to be very similar for you each and every time. And when I asked you this question, if you drew a blank when I asked you, number one, if you drew a blank, you aren't going to be looking for these shots when you're playing a point. You aren't going to be looking for them, so you won't be ready for it. Second of all, you won't be rallying with the intent to set those shots up. All right? I guarantee you, if you don't know what your, your closing shots are, what your, the best way for you to close points, if you don't know what the close looks like for you, you won't be closing very much, right? So get specific with this. Let's say it's a, it's a backhand up the line, right, where you rip it up the line. Right? I would ask you then, how do you set that backhand up? Do you slice short 
to make your opponent reach like this and then bang, hit it up the line? Or do you have a great angle where you pull them out wide, right? And wait for them not to recover and then bang, pull it up the line. So how, how are you gonna set that up? When you think about, you know, the common examples, Nadal, Federer, what does Nadal do? He goes, hey, he hits that heavy top spin. He kicks it lefty spin, kicks it out of the strike zone. And then Nadal looks for that inside out to slam that forehand. Federer, he plays that short slice. He makes his opponent reach. If they don't hit a deep slice back, Federer runs around it, bang, pulls that inside in. And now I know those guys play at a very high level. And they have so many combos and ways to close. But even you and I, if you're playing enough tennis, you should be closing points in similar ways. There's only so many really ways to close, right? There's only so many shots, unless you have 12 great shots and know how to close off 12 different shots, it should be very similar, right? Each and every day you play, you should have pretty consistent ways that you're winning these matches. And if you're not, you're playing pretty randomly, okay? So really think about that. And now that you're playing with intent, these scenarios, you're gonna see it right away, and it's gonna pop up, you're gonna recognize it right off the bat, you're gonna be, it's gonna make closing that much easier. Now guys, although you're prepared for the close, you won't exactly know when the close will come. Sometimes very early in the point, it could be the first ball or the return. Sometimes it could be later in the point, and sometimes never. So how do we really know? And what you need to start learning how to do, and the better and the more experience you get at closing, you have to be able to read the signs. Read the signs of when that, when that scale is about to tip, when you're about to reach that, the upper limits of your opponent's pressure threshold. And those signs might be, again, out of the strike zone, above the shoulders, below the knees, when they're reaching, when they're off balance, all right? That's a good sign. Or how about just on the full, you know, on the full sprint like that? That's a pretty good sign. And when you see that pressure, when you think there might be an opportunity to close, when you see the signs, that's when you have to, what I call, heighten your focus. Heighten your focus, you're basically, it's more, you're watching the ball more closely, you're more locked in, you're more precise, it allows you to be sharper because when you're attacking, finishing, and closing, there's a lot less margin. You have to be very precise with your feet. There's less margin over the net because you're probably hitting it low and hard to put the ball away. Compared to, let's just say earlier in the point, when you're rallying and grinding it out, you're eight feet behind the baseline going, ah, right, ah, and you have a lot of margin even though you're using physical energy you don't need that much mental energy, that much focus on every single ball. There's not as much, there's so much more margin, right? So not every moment in the point is created equal. That's on a micro level. On a macro level, one all in a set is very different from the seven point tie break, right? So you need to have the situational awareness. And I talked about raising your energy level in another video, I'll link you to, go watch that. You have to have the situational awareness to raise your and heighten your focus because closing takes a lot of focus. So what separates players who look good rallying back and forth in matches versus players who actually close and win and rack up points in matches? That comes down to looking for the signs. As you can see here, this is a pretty casual rally in a match and maybe even too casual for my taste. but at least he's looking for that opportunity to hit his closing shot and I'm going to give you a good guess of what that shot is. Every time we play a set I see a handful of the same types of closes and that's for very good reason. Although it's the same exact shot being let's say forehand up the line, there's so much nuance and variance to hitting that same shot because he has to measure the distance, the speed of his opponent, how much space he has, how fast he can get it through the court, different scenarios, different conditions being hot or cold. So it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of experience to really get great closing even off the same shot. In terms of specific signs to close while he's playing a older coach like myself, it's going to be likely poor recovery as you saw earlier in the points. And also, a lot of times I forget to mix up my serves. I'll hit the second serve in the same place, and every time he catches me getting lulled to sleep, I'll see a few punished serves just like this. Now, guys, for the next concept, if you've ever watched Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belford is a legendary sales trainer. And although he kind of went off the rails in his personal life for a bit, 
he produced consistent closers time and time again. Now, when we think about closing and pitching our product and selling, there is all these different features and benefits you can use to describe your product, right? But what Jordan taught was to never fire your best cannon first. Save your best shot for later. You would never give your you never give your best feature and benefit up front when you're selling your product, and that's because the human mind can only see relativity, it can't see absolutes. And here's what I mean, okay? If you ever jump into a jacuzzi, pss, ah, it feels hot the first minute or so. 15 minutes later, the water feels maybe lukewarm at best. How about getting out of, sh out of a hot shower? Oh, the air feels chilly and cold. That's because you can feel that differential. So. If you, if, if I get, told you the, if I'm selling you my product and I told you the absolute best thing, I might wow you off the start, but every other benefit I tell you thereafter is gonna be like, eh, and it won't have very emotion, much emotional impact. And a lot of tennis players come out on the first point trying to, ah, ah, you know, hit all their best shots and show their best stuff. Yes, you'll shock your opponent the first game or two, but your opponent will very quickly get used to the pace, get used to the rhythm, lock into the timing, and start adjusting. That's very different from, say, you know, you're serving at 80%, and then, all, then every now and then, bang, you serve at 100%. That's going to feel like a thousand percent to your opponent. Compared to if you're just bombing serve after serve after serve to your opponent, then they're going to zone in on that serve. To use another sport, like baseball, in the ninth inning, oftentimes they have the, the closing, the closer pitcher, who has this lightning fastball that for the first eight innings, none of the players have seen yet, and it's just a shock, and they specialize in closing those games out. Now, I'm not saying, guys, to, that you should, you know, not play hard from the first point, but save a little shock factor, a little surprise factor. Remember, you have 48 points to go. You don't have to give it all away on the first game or two. Your profit on a mere $6,000 investment would be upwards of $60,000. All right, guys, now, now back to sales. The other rule is when you go for the close, you never want to ask the same way for the close twice. So basically, here's how it goes. If I was talking to a customer, Mr. Customer, would you like to buy product XYZ? And the customer says, nah, nah, I don't want to buy. Now, let's say I handle the objection I present a very valid reason, and then I repeat, I ask that same question again, Mr. Customer, now would you like to buy? Now, here's a problem with that, because even if I'm right as a salesperson, what I'm doing is I'm having the customer admit that their previous assumption was wrong, was incorrect. I'm kind of making them feel stupid, and no one likes that, that feeling of feeling stupid. So many times the customer will stick with their original no maybe even out of spite or get emotional or feel like you're being pushy and trying to bulldoze them. So what's the solution here? Even if I'm right, what's the solution here? I'm gonna try from a different angle, okay? You know, Mr. Customer, I know for the, some of these technical sales gurus, okay, this might not be perfect, but just using this as an example, Mr. Customer, you know, I, you have 100%, you're 100% right for objecting XYZ product wasn't right for you. But what if we combine XYZ with product ABC and package that together to create a whole new solution? Do you think that might be able to fix the problem you're trying to address here? Right now, I slightly modify the offer and now the customer can agree with me without feeling stupid that they changed their mind. All right, so when it comes to closing, guys, a little bit of creativity can go a long way. Based on that, when it comes to finishing points, all right, now don't try anything wacky, like, you know, b behind the back between Nick, some Nick Kyrgios kind of thing, all right? And don't try any of these weird tactics. Don't try to do underhand serves. That's not what I'm talking about here, all right? I'm just talking about when you're finishing points, adding just a little bit of a wrinkle, okay? So, for example, me, when I play, I don't hit a whole lot of slice serve. So sometimes on a big point, I might hit a, uh, a really heavy, even more of a, like a banana slice. It just changes. It just gives them a different look. Okay. Or on the return game, I'm, I might raise my energy and take a few serves really early. Now, 
when you're doing this, it still has to be within your core competence. Don't try something you're not good at just for the sake of doing it. Again, that's called desperation. So it's not like I'm bad at taking re re returns earlier. I have a bad slice serve. I just don't do it quite as often, all right? I just don't abuse that same tactic again and again and again, okay? Just this past US Open, Rafael Nadal was playing Diego Schwartzman, who's you know not the tallest player, and what Rafa would do is, and the ground stroke points were very close. At the, late in the set, Rafa would just throw the ball soft and high and just drop it very deep close to the baseline. And it's not that Diego Schwartzman couldn't hit, hit, attack those, because he's very, very good. It's just, it was a different look for him, and he didn't hit it quite as clean. Rafa was able to take advantage of it. All right, so to kind of sum up this section that we talked about here, my coach would always use... Uh, a, a, the card game of Big Two or Uno, if you ever played those games, is a really a great analogy for closing. And those games, are, the goal is to try to get rid of all the cards in your hand. Well, if you ever played those games, you would know you don't want to show your opponent your best cards too early. You want to let, you know, let those cards go in a blitz, right? In different combos and be creative with it, okay? So really think about this concept when you're closing. When I talk about not doing wacky or desperate things, He's never closed on a backhand drop shot, like ever. So I'm not even saying it's a wrong shot here, but it's highly unlikely. This next point to hold serve, he's standing a little bit wider to give himself a sharper angle, and I wouldn't necessarily suggest to, for all players to do this, but it worked. I time the serve early, he hits the winner to the open court. Another way to close this time on the return of serve, and again, we all need to break at some point to win the set, is to use a lot more energy on the return. And while he had been laying serves in, he takes it early, hits it deep, and follows up. On this next point, you're going to see me. A lot of times when I see break point, I'm going to be extra focused and try to rip that return hard and deep. All right, guys, so we've talked a lot about the close as being almost this big moment of truth, right? But what if that was sort of the wrong way to go about it? What if there's an alternative way? What actually if there was really no such thing as a close, okay? And really, here's what I mean. So let's say you're, you're on the court, you're playing, and you get an easy forehand, you, you load that forehand up, and you're thinking in your mind, this is my big opportunity. Here it is. I got to make this shot, right? And you just go for it, right? It's kind of like the salesperson who's, who's thinking, let me take a shot in the dark. I have no idea whether the customer wants to buy or not or whether they're interested, but you know what, what the heck, I'm just going to ask anyways. Now, the good thing is at least you had the courage to give it, give it a shot to ask or to go for the shot in tennis. The problem is, see, many people close like they're playing the lottery, and it's not quite like that. Okay, so to explain this concept, there's two rules here. Rule number one, never ask for a close that you can't get. And rule number two is everything is a close. Again, rule number one, think about this. Rule number one is never ask for a close you can't get. Number two, rule number two is everything is a close. Okay, so let's start from the beginning from square one here. So when you meet a customer then they don't know you, they have no obligation to talk to you, they don't care, they, they can leave at any point in time, right? So when, from the moment of, hey Mr. Customer, how are you doing today? Right? When I reach my hand to shake their hand, if they shake my hand back, that's a handshake close. Then, then I'll say, hey Mr. Customer, based on everything you're telling me, right, I think I might have a product that might help you here. Do you have a minute? And if they agree to a demo, then I got a demo close. And again, they can leave at any point in the process. So everything I ask for has to be highly calibrated. And I can only ask for a close that I can get. Now, ideally, we want every, each and every time I ask for a close, it gains a little bit more. I ask for a little bit more compliance until hopefully they ultimately buy, right? But as a salesperson, look, if I overstep my bounds, if I ask for the sale, if I ask for the sale 
before I've built up value in my product. If I ask for a demo and I ha don't even know what, th haven't discovered their needs, or if I try to ask all these hard qualifying questions and you know, I haven't built any connection or rapport, then the customer is just going to say, screw you, they're going to get pissed off and they're going to leave. Now, it's really the same thing when you're on the tennis court. There's really no such thing as a big close. Instead, it's a process, right? You should think, in your mind, you should really think every ball is a setup ball. Once you sort of internalize that mentality, you're going to be able to close with patience, and you're going to be calibrated when you close. I know some coaches just tell their players, just be all out aggressive. Well, kind of like the salesperson who's asking for too much. You can only be as aggressive, or I should say, you can only take as much risk as the situation allows. Right, that's where shot selection comes in because you know, if you're trying to close off something too hard, then you're just taking unnecessary risk. Now, you could close very early in the point, very possible, but if you're playing a good player or especially a good defender, it's going to take more than one shot to close. Now, if a salesperson is thinking that one shot mentality, right, they go for that one big close, right? So they go for that one big close, the customer puts up resistance, the customer objects, then the salesperson, ugh, they give up, right? They're like, they don't handle the objection, they stop problem solving, and they lost the sale. When in theory, if the customer puts up some rejection or resist, sometimes they're still in that gray area stage. They, they just don't know yet. What a great salesperson does is they handle the objection and understand that the objections along the way is literally just a step in the path and they continue driving to the close. Now, if you just, in tennis, if you just go for broke, sometimes I don't even have, I don't even mind players going for broke. Sure, it's too much risk sometimes, but, you know, whatever. The, the thing here is when, you, when you players go for broke, the even bigger problem is the fact they're not ready for the ball to come back. See, you need to expect the ball to always come back no matter how hard you hit it. And I think Fed is a great example of this. Now, we all know Fed hits a lot of clean winners, but I still believe his mindset, his mindset is every ball is a setup ball, right? Because let's say Fed plays the great defender, you know, Djokovic or Nadal, unbelievable retrievers. You never see Federer, bang, rip to the corner and then, whoa, 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 and then, then not ready. Fed is always ready for that next team because he's always looking to hit three, four, five, six closing shots if he needs to. And the fact that he's a persistent closer really makes him one of the game's best closers we've ever seen. Gasps from the crowd. Oh, court position is exquisite. So tight to the baseline. It's so hard. It's so early. Look at the net clear. So when we talk about closing, how do we know when to go for the close without just, again, closing blindly, right? Like you're playing the lottery. And obviously in sales, you wouldn't go for broke. You wouldn't ask for the sale, you know, off the open, right? That'd be stupid. What we actually do in sales is called trial closing, where it could be like a series of pings, statements. You're paying the customer's interest, essentially, as you progress through the sale to figure out where they are. And you know, it could be throwing out little suggestions, little little agreements they could they could buy into, or th theoreticals. And again, for those super technical salespeople, this won't be the best, but this is a good example, right? You know, I'd say something like, "Mr. Customer, you know, let's say I'm selling a sofa. If you were to buy this sofa, or maybe even not this one, but something similar to that, right? See, if is a hypothetical there. Do you think you would?" prefer the blue color, you could see yourself working with the blue color, the black, or the brown. Well, I'm definitely not asking for the sale outright, but I'm very much insinuating it. You see the big difference there? So the customer could keep going along that track, or they could say, nah, they don't like it. Either way, if they, if they say no, they didn't say no to the fact that they're, they're, they won't buy. They just said no to the color. And if I was a skilled per salesperson, I have a chance at maybe turning it around. Oh, well, Mr. Customer, 
Is it because you don't, you don't think the dimensions will fit with the space you're working with? Or Mr. Customer, it might just not fit the vibe of your room, and then you can maybe find another solution for the customer, right? But at least you have a shot. Like in tennis, if you just go for broke 100% and you miss, you don't have another shot at the point because the point's over. I always say keep probing your opponent, probing. Probing with, of course, consistency, direction, depth, spin, and power. And when you put pressure on your, again, when you're put pressure to try to break that pressure threshold of your opponent, what you're going to start to see is similar responses from your opponent, right? When they're probed in different ways. And now since you have similar responses, you kind of know what to expect and you're not closing on blind faith. First, let's start with what not to do. And he starts his point with a great return heavy and deep, which produces a short slice in response and he reacts kind of late which limits his options here so he's reaching so the right play here is to hit a defensive slice to my weaker side get back and recover instead he pushes it right up the middle and he's asking to get past it's like why did he come to net here's another bad example again he hits a great return deep but I'm ready and on balance. Okay, so he gets a run around forehand, and this should be an inside out, okay, in setting up his next shot. But instead, he tries to close off this and go inside in. The problem is, I'm still ready and on balance for him to close. You can't close on this. Therefore, I open up the court with a cross court and make him pay on that next shot and squeeze him out. Now with a little bit more patience and probing, and again, I've already seen him. He's kind of moving slow that day we were playing. So I see him not recover. I see the backhand reaching, and it's very easy for me to step in and take time away. Now another smart close here. He gets a little lucky with this left court, which kind of throws my rhythm off. I'm kind of out of sync here. And then he hits a nice heavy deep lob and he sees me go to a slice which is very hard to slice on the rise and he's seen this a bunch of times where it floats he comes in for an easy swing volley. Guys now I do get it sometimes you have to go for broke I would only say really just go for broke go for it all when you really think there's a highly likelihood of closing but when we talk about closing in general not every point was meant to be closed, right? Just like in sales, not every customer was meant to be closed. You can't force a close, you can't rush a close, you can't create a close that isn't there. Basically what I'm saying is you cannot sell ice to an Eskimo because an Eskimo doesn't really need ice. Just like you can't close off Ivo Karlovich's serve because it's bouncing over your head at 130 miles an hour. To think you can close on everything, to think you can sell on everything, that's a very stupid idea, okay? So when we think about sales as a whole, sales, it's a lot more, I mean, it's as much of an art as it is a science. It takes a lot of experience, both tactically, but both emotionally, you know, keeping yourself together, right, as you go through the process. On top of that, there's what I call a variability layer on top of it. And please go watch my variability video. It's essential to really understanding the mental concepts of tennis okay, to understand variability. But funny, funny enough, you might, it might sound crazy, it's very common that a newbie salesperson comes in and for a short duration of time outsells a skilled veteran. You think, how could that happen? Well, anything can happen in the short term, but over many, many sales, there's no chance to outsell the skilled veteran, right? And while you think, oh, Steven, all these, you know, cheesy sales lines, I get it, won't work on, on me as a buyer, you know, you're right, it won't work on you. But as a salesperson, if you're talking to hundreds or thousands of prospects, having a better structure for your sales and knowing where you are in the sale and having awareness, that type of thing when you're closing, it's gonna increase your margins by a lot because the margin to close is already you know, pretty small in sales. So that's how I hope it's gonna to translate to your game in tennis, not match to match, because look, every match has so many variables. On a single match, it comes down to just one or two shots. Okay, but if you implement these principles over a long period of time, over maybe 50 matches, your overall results, I guarantee you, will definitely 
improve once you implement these concepts, all right? So I know this was a longer video. Feel free to go back and through each of these sections, and it's gonna take some time to work these in, okay? But thanks for getting this far in the video. Subscribe if and hit that notification bell if you like this style of video. I know it's a little bit of different. I don't do these all the time, but I'd love to hear your comments below of what you think. I'm also going to, at some point in the future, talk about how to destroy a pusher, you know, along the lines of closing, because, you know, pushers are a little annoying sometimes, all right? So thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys soon on the next episode.